good morning everyone uh, welcome to another session of medicinal biochemistry today we will deal with the protein or enzymes isolations and their purification yeah so we will deal with that part So in this part protein or enzyme uh, we will deal with their isolation, quantitation and purification. So within that we will deal with the homogenization, how we homogenize our sample, then fractionate it, centrifuge it, then quantitate it, then with the help of chromatography we tend to uh, purify it and then with the electrophoresis also uh, we tend to separate our molecules. So some of the famous people who got the Nobel Prize winner in chromatography and electrophoresis, uh, Martin, um, Singe and Tislas for the, for the partition chromatography. Then Fan, Tanaka, Swedberg for the mass spectrometry and sedimentation techniques. And Lloyd, Claude, Duve and Plade and their work was an organelle fractionation that is to get your organelles uh, you know from your cells to get them separated with the help of fractionation technique. The most famous Frederick Sanger from 1958 and 1980 from United Kingdom he got two times double prize winner one for the to identify the structure of proteins especially of insulin and second for the sequencing that is famous from his name Sanger sequencing which we are still using. So protein isolation, first step is that you disrupt your cells, crude separation of homogenous into fractionations. Then homogenization means your Downs homogenizer, you use your sonication, osmotic shock, French press. And then further in fractionation with the help of fractionational precipitation like pH, heat, ammonium sulfate precipitation, differential centrifugation, all these things are being used in that. So homogenate forms, so we use centrifuge at 500 G for 10 minutes. And then in the palate we have our nuclear fractions and in the supranatant uh, there is nothing. There is a, we can do it for further centrifugation for 10,000 G for 20 minutes. So once we are done, so in the palate you will have a mitochondrial fractionation and further with the 100,000 G for one hour you will have uh, your like in the, in the palate will be your microsomal fractionation and in the top part will be your cytosol, soluble proteins. So that's how we isolate proteins. So we have a more dense particle, less dense particle via centrifugation. So you can separate between different particles. You centrifuge them, then they will be the one which are heavy. They will form the pallet and the one on the top will be remain on top. On the other hand, that was a differential centrifugation. Then there's a rate zonal centrifugation in which you have a sucrose gradient into which you add your mixture of a large and small particles. Then after the centrifugation, they got separated. They will make two layers and you separate them uh, via the hole. So different speeds, uh, 10,000, 10, 10,000, 3,000, 40,000, different molecules are possible to get separated. So protein quantitation, so that's a Lowry uh, protein determination method. So in this, um, basically, uh, it helps to get your protein out from 10 microgram to 1000 microgram per ml. Uh, it was discovered by Lowry to identify how much protein is present, but that was not so well known, uh, like accepted. Then the Bradford protein determination method came out, uh, which is quite simpler, faster than the Lowry method, and is subject to have less interference. So, in this, we use Commercy Blue G250 dye 
which appears to bind most readily uh, adenyl and lysyl res residues of proteins. And then can we can identify our proteins that whether they are present. So we can get to know about from 5 to 25 microgram per ml protein in a sample. So let us see how we do this work. Uh, this part today it will be more of the virtual lab actually. In this video, you will learn how to perform protein quantitation using the Bradford assay. Protein quantitation is one of the most commonly performed procedures in a biotechnology laboratory. In this activity, the protein concentration in milk will be measured using the Bradford assay. For this activity, you will need 1x Bradford reagent and 1x phosphate buffered saline or PBS. Using a 20 to 200 microliter micropipette, set the pipette to 98 microliters. Pipette 98 microliters of 1x PBS into an empty microcentrifuge tube labeled sample. Switch to a 2 to 20 microliter micropipette and set the pipette to 2 microliters. Pipette 2 microliters of milk sample into the microtube labeled sample A. Mix the milk sample and PBS by either pipetting or vortexing. This mixture has diluted the milk to one part in 50. Label two cuvettes, one control and the other sample. Do not handle the cuvette where the light passes through and make certain your labels are well above this area. Pipette 20 microliters of diluted milk sample into the cuvette labeled sample and 20 microliters of 1x PBS into the cuvette labeled control. Next we will set up protein standards. See your protocol for the correct concentrations. Label a cuvette for each standard and mark it with the corresponding concentration. Next, add 20 microliters of each protein standard into the corresponding cuvette. Make certain you use a clean pipette tip for each sample. Now you are ready to add the Bradford reagent to all of the cuvettes you have prepared, including the sample and control. Add one milliliter of 1x Bradford reagent to each of the cuvettes. Mix completely by pipetting up and down with the micropipette. Incubate the cuvettes at room temperature for five minutes. After five minutes, visually compare the cuvette containing the milk sample to the cuvettes containing the protein standards. Determine the standard that most closely matches the color of the milk sample. Estimate the protein concentration of the milk sample based upon the visual comparison. To determine the protein concentration using a spectrophotometer, select for the Bradford assay. When asked to insert blank into the spectrophotometer, insert the cuvette labeled control. Use the blank to set the spectrophotometer to zero absorbance or 100% transmittance. 
If instructed, read the absorbance of the seven protein standards and record the absorbance values. Remove the cuvette labeled blank and insert the milk sample into the spectrophotometer. Read the absorbance and record the value. So very simple method. Okay, so now Let's talk about protein quantitation. So it's a biotechnique method where we develop and characterize the nano orange protein quantitation assay, a fluorescence based assay of proteins in solutions. So here we add a dye to the sample, heat for 10 minutes, cool to the room temperature and read the fluorescence. Yeah. Then how we use this ultra sensitive method, so basically uh, you have on the y axis fluorescence on the x axis protein, so at the various fluorescence you will get various concentration values, so by having this curve we can identify our concentration at that. So now comes, we have done with the various isolation methods, we are done with the, you know, purification, now comes the purification methods. So how we purify our protein with the help of dialysis method. So it's a technique that is used to determine, uh, remove your small molecules for protein solutions or uh, to change the buffer compositions. So there are some small and large molecules between, uh, within this dialysis uh, packet. So we need to remove them. So what will happen? We will add into the buffer. So at the start of dialysis, nothing will change. But as the equilibrium is achieved, so small molecules will go all out. Once they all go out, so inside uh, there is nothing. Yeah, so let's see uh, how this is done.
was the separation method. Now within this uh, after this dialysis, this is called liquid chromatography in which we refer to as a chromatographic method uh, in which mobile phase is your liquid and a stationary phase may be liquid or solid anything would be happen. So let's say we have this gel filtration chromatography we have to we want to separate your proteins by size. So there is a protein sample in your you know this gel gel filtration. So you do with the help of molecular exclusion gel uh, you separate your three molecules your yellow, green and red ok. So, so once they are being started to separate so what will happen there is a carbon carbohydrate polymer beads. So they tend to attach the small molecules like the red one and they will be attached to this part and the, they start to flow yeah and then the yellow one will flow very fast will go out because they are not able to attach then the green one and then the red one. So we can see here the yellow one goes very fast then the green one and the red one. So the same thing uh, red and green they started to separate and then they tend to go out. So we having different gels here Cephadex G10, Cephadex G75 according to the density. So our material like hemoglobin this, sorry it is Hb uh, being separated. So let us see how this gel exclusion chromatography is taken place. We are starting with gel filtration medium. This is Cephadex G50. The number here gives you an approximation of the size exclusion. So this is, uh, will exclude proteins about 50 kilodaltons, 50,000 molecular weight. Inside is a white powder. In this beaker I put 9 grams of the G50 powder and I swelled the powder overnight using this Tris buffer, 30 millimolar Tris buffer, pH 8.0. You can see that the 9 grams has swollen up to a volume of about 90 milliliters, almost 10 milliliters per gram of solid. Now we're going to gently stir the gel. It's important not to stir this too vigorously. Don't mechanically stir this. That can break your gel particles up into very fine dust which will impede your flow rate in the column. So this is making a slurry. I'm using a sawed off pipette to transfer my slurry to the column. For gel filtration I want a fairly tall gel bed. So I'm trying to mostly fill this column and the uh, buffer, excess buffer will drip out the bottom. So here you can see the drips coming out the bottom. Gel bed is starting to settle a little bit. Gel bed is right here. I'll add a little more buffer so that it doesn't run dry at the top. So I'm gently adding a little buffer to the top. This looks great. You can see the gel bed is fully settled here. There's a little bit of buffer on the top. I've capped the bottom right now to keep it from going dry. I'm going to put a mixture of two molecules onto the column. Blue dextran is a very large molecule. It's a polysaccharide. Molecular weight about a million. Fluorescein, on the other hand, is a small molecule. Molecular weight about 350 grams per mole. I chose these two molecules because they're nicely colored, so I'll be easy to be able to see the separation visually as they go through the gel filtration. I've drained the buffer so now there's no residual buffer on top of the gel and I've made a mixture of a total of 0.8 milliliters, 400 microliters of the fluorescein, 400 microliters of the blue dextran, nice green color. I'll separate these on my gel. For this size column, uh, this is getting near the maximum I would put on the column. 
I'm using a pastor pipette to gently load my material onto the column without disturbing the gel bed. So here you can see the blue molecules, the large molecules, are moving faster through the gel. So I like hope that I can get a complete separation between the blue and the yellow. Now the excess on the top of the gel is, is all soaked in. So I'm adding buffer very carefully to the top of my gel filtration column. I'll just add a fraction of a milliliter first to help get everything into the gel before I add a large volume of buffer. So now the separation is proceeded somewhat. I'm going to try to add a decently large volume this time of buffer on the top. About a milliliter would be great. If I do this well, then the buffer that I put on the top remains colorless because all the colored molecules have already gone into the gel. Alright, now you can start to see a little colorless layer on the top. That's perfect. All the colored molecules are in the G50 and they're starting to separate quite nicely. The yellow molecules are up here, the blue are down here. Still got a little overlap, so I may have overloaded this column, but we'll see. I, I, I'm hoping that before the blue molecules elute that they'll actually be separated from the yellow, but it's going to be close. So out of the bottom now, blue liquid is dripping. You can see I do have a colorless layer starting to develop here. The Fluorescein has been slowed down by the gel filtration. The blue dextran is coming through. So this technique is often used to separate a protein, which is large, from the small molecules that could be salts or could be a fluorescent tag that is unwanted. I've topped up with buffer on the top so that it never runs dry. The fluorescein is now eluding from the column. Fluorescein is fluorescent. I'm shining a little blue light, UV light on it, and you can see it glows green. The last little bits of fluorescein are emerging from the column now. Here's the fractionation. This first tube has nothing in it. Uh, so this volume, which looks to me about two and a half milliliters, is called a void volume, where nothing comes out. But then the blue molecules, the blue dextran, came through the column swiftly. So this is about a milliliter. Uh, some of the blue dextran tailed into the next fraction. This is low concentration. Then I have a, a nearly colorless fraction here, and then the fluorescein starts coming out here. Fluorescein stopped coming out right about here. So the total volume will be two and a half, three and a half four and a half, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about ten milliliters is the total volume, which is what I would expect for a column of this size. Often what you want is just this first fraction with the large molecules. If you're trying to desalt a protein or remove the unbound label from a protein, then this is the fraction that has value. These fractions would just be junk. The original mixture, you can see, glows nicely and what I believe is isolated blue dextran from the column has no glow in the UV. That's a sign that I have successfully separated out all the fluorescein from the blue dextran. So the column, if I've done it well, comes out completely colorless. It's reusable. Sometimes microorganisms like to grow in the cephadex, so if you want to preserve your column for a long period, keep it in the fridge, certainly. And sometimes uh, azide is added to the buffer to prevent growth of microorganisms. Here's Tris buffer with 0.01% sodium azide, and this will prevent microorganisms from chewing on the dextran that's in the column if you're storing it over a long period of time.
so that was the child exclusion chromatography we'll share these videos and presentations uh, after the lecture is over because if i started to share now they tend to you know um, they will not work out Then comes your ion exchange chromatography, next one, in which protein in a solution has a low ionic strength, then add it to the column, and the protein interacts with the beads via electrostatic interaction. And resins carrying positive charge are called anion exchanger, because anions will exchange on this type of column. And resins carrying negative charge are called cation exchanger, because cations will exchange on this type of column. So you have these negative, negative beads. On these, your positive will come and attach. So, positively charged proteins will bind to the negatively charged beads. And negatively charged beads will start to flow from your sample. So, there will be two types of ion exchange chromatography. One is anion exchange chromatography and cation exchange chromatography. So, anion exchange chromatography, the matrix carries a net positive charge, which means it interacts with the negatively charged protein strongly. And in the cation exchange chromatography matrix is negatively charged and it is interact with the positively charged proteins. So let's see how this is done. Ion exchange chromatography is it allows the separation of ions and polar molecules based on their charge. As well as other forms of chromatography, in ion chromatography, there is a mobile phase, which generally consists of buffer solution. And there is a stationary phase which consists of a matrix that contains charged ionizable functional groups. This type of chromatography is subdivided into anion-ion exchange chromatography and cation-ion exchange chromatography. Anion-ion exchange chromatography. Negatively charged molecules are attracted to a positively charged solid support which is usually beads that provide a positively charged surface, such as resin quaternary ammonium. In cation exchange chromatography, positively charged molecules are attracted to negatively charged solid support, which is commonly beads that provide negatively charged functional groups, such as resin methyl sulfate. Ion exchange chromatography is frequently used for the separation and purification of proteins. The basic process of this chromatography can be represented in four steps. Conditioning or equilibration of the stationary phase, sample loading, washing, and elution of the retained molecules. The first step is the equilibration of the stationary phase to the desired start conditions. The pH and ionic strength of the sample buffer are selected to ensure that, when sample is loaded, proteins of interest bind to the medium, and as many impurities as possible do not bind. Therefore, the same buffer is used for the equilibration of the stationary phase. When equilibrium is reached, all stationary phase charged groups are bound with exchangeable counter ions, such as chloride or sodium. When the column is equilibrated, the second step is sample application. Depending on the pH of their environment, proteins may carry a net positive charge, a net negative charge, or no charge. This net charge can be determined by comparing the pHi of each protein with the pH of the buffer. Proteins are large biomolecules, consisting of one or more long chains of amino acid residues. Amino acids are organic compounds that contain amine and carboxyl functional groups along with a side chain specific to each amino acid. Depending on the pH of their environment, the amino group can be protonated and became positively charged. The carboxyl group can be deprotonated and became negatively charged. And the side chain of some amino acids can become positively or negatively charged due to the gain or loss of protons. So, the net charge on the molecule can be positive, neutral, or negative. The isoelectric point or PHI is the pH at which a protein carries neutral charge. At a pH below their isoelectric point, proteins carry a net positive charge. And at a pH above their isoelectric point, they carry a net negative charge. In this example the pH of the buffer is equal 5, consequently, 
Protein A has a net negative charge, and both protein B and C carry a net positive charge. In addition, protein C is more positively charged since its PHI is higher than the PHI of protein B. If we apply cation exchange chromatography, protein that has a net positive charge, it will bind to the negative charge beads of the stationary phase. On the other hand, uncharged proteins, or those with a net negative charge, would not bind. They pass through the column at the same speed as the flow of buffer. When all the sample has been loaded, the next step is column washing. The column is washed with start buffer. To ensure that all non-binding proteins have passed through the column. When all the sample has been loaded and the column washed, conditions are altered in order to elute the bound proteins. Most frequently, proteins are eluted by increasing the ionic strength of the buffer, or, occasionally, by changing the pH. As ionic strength increases, the salt ions compete with the bound components for charges on the surface of the medium, and one or more of the bound species begin to elute and move down the column. The proteins with the lowest net charge at the selected pH will be the first ones eluted from the column as ionic strength increases. Similarly, the proteins with the highest charge will be most strongly retained and will be eluted last. Protein B has the lowest net positive charge, so it can be eluted first. Then, protein C with the highest net positive charge, it can be eluted next, by increasing the salt concentration. Also varying the pH of the buffer can be used to affect a separation, and to elute the retained proteins. As we seen, the PHI of the protein B is equal 7, and the PHI of protein C is equal 9. So if we add a buffer with pH above the isoelectric point of protein B and below the isoelectric point of protein C, the protein B will become negatively charged and can then be eluted. The protein C is still charged positively, consequently, still retained. Next, protein C can be eluted if we apply a buffer with pH above its isoelectric point. So, it becomes negatively charged and it will pass through the column. One of the primary advantages for the use of ion chromatography is only one interaction involved during the separation. Another advantage of ion exchange is the predictability of elution patterns. By controlling changes in ionic strength or in pH of the buffer, using different forms of gradient, proteins are eluted differently in a purified, concentrated form. Okay. Now comes next is affinity chromatography. Uh, this is mainly depend upon your uh, knowledge of the properties of the enzymes, proteins that you want to isolate. So either antibodies must be available that have been raised against the enzyme or the enzyme must be known to be bind to the some substrate such as ligand known covalently in reversible way. So it is the most specific chromatographic method because it relies on the specific binding of the target protein with its specific ligand. So here we have like red and blue mixture of our samples and the red one could recognize the antibody inside our sample and the blue not. So red will attach, blue will go out. Uh, so blue will go out first then red will remain there. Yeah. So there is a drawback of affinity chromatography that it binds to a ligand or antibody that can often be strong that are very harsh conditions and that are needed to elute the enzyme. So this leads to denaturation. Then there is a non-specific binding may also occur especially where large ligands such as antibodies are employed. So this non-specific binding can overwhelm the correct binding sites at very high protein concentrations leading to the pure purification. So thus there is often limit to the protein concentration that can be applied to affinity column.
affinity Separation in affinity chromatography depends upon the reversible adsorption of biomolecules through biospecific interactions on the ligand. Most affinity chromatography experiments are performed in three main stages, equilibration, sample application and wash, and dilution. The first step is the equilibration of the stationary phase to the desired start conditions. The second step is sample application and wash. The goal in this step is to bind the target molecules and wash out all unbound material. Non-binding molecules will pass through in the flow-through during washing with binding buffer. In the third step, elution, biomolecules are released from the biospecific ligand into the elution buffer by change in the buffer composition. A common way is to increase pH of the buffer. short animation now comes this will be the last topic of today HPLC that is high pressure liquid chromatography, which is an enhanced column method for protein separation here resin signs resin signs are more refined and this method basically you applied your sample over the HPLC columns um, on which after the separation we get the peaks that is the resolution to understand the chromatography column. So reason for is that HPLC columns are packed with much smaller beads than those in the standard columns. So simple alteration greatly increases the number of theoretical plates and hence resolution. So an intermediate uh, version between a column and HPLC is called FPLC meaning fast performance liquid chromatography. So in basically in HPLC your column is quite large um, but very small particles of gel beads known as stationary phase. So chromatographic bed is composed by the gel beads alone with the inside the column and a sample is introduced into the injector and then carried into the column by flowing solvent. So once in the column the sample got mixture got separated as a result different components adhering or diffusing into the gel. So as a result it's forced to chromatographic bed by the flow rate. So this is how we get these resolutions, uh, different absorbance at 220 nanometer with cross 10 minutes of time. So these belongs to various peaks, various samples that are being separated. So let's see the last uh, content of today. HPLC stands for High Performance Liquid Chromatography, but could equally well stand for High Pressure Liquid Chromatography. It is used for separating mixtures, either to analyze the mixture or to separate a required product from others in a reaction mixture. It can also be used to find the relative amounts of different components in a mixture. HPLC works on the same principle as paper chromatography, here shown speeded up. A liquid, called the mobile phase, moves past a solid, the stationary phase. In paper chromatography, the stationary phase consists of water molecules bound to the cellulose in the paper. The mobile phase carries different components of a mixture, called the sample, along with it at different rates. How fast each one moves depends on its relative affinity for the mobile and the stationary phases. For example, if the mobile phase is more polar than the stationary phase, the more polar components of a mixture will tend to move more quickly than the less polar ones. In HPLC, the stationary phase is a solid packed into a column, like one of these. This particular column contains silica particles to which C8 hydrocarbons are attached, making the stationary phase nonpolar. In paper chromatography, the solvent moves along the paper by capillary action. 
In HPLC, the liquid is forced through the column by high pressure pumps. The whole apparatus looks like this. These bottles contain solvents. Two solvents can be mixed in any proportions to give a mixture, the liquid phase, a suitable polarity for the separation that is being done. In this case, one solvent is water, very polar, and the other, ethane nitrile, less polar. The operator can decide on a mixture with the correct polarity for the separation she is doing. These are the pumps. They produce a pressure of 15,000 kilopascals, 150 times that of the atmosphere, hence the name High Pressure Liquid Chromatography. If a single sample is to be run, it is injected into the solvent stream here, in the injection port, via a hypodermic syringe. Alternatively, several samples can be run in succession by loading them into this auto sampler, which will run them in order without any human intervention. The pumps force the mixed solvents through the column. The solvent emerging from the column and carrying the separated components of the mixture passes into the detector. Here, a beam of ultraviolet light shines through it. This light is set at a wavelength that is absorbed by all the components to be separated. When the detector reading drops, the component that is absorbing UV light is coming out of the column and passing through the detector. Many alternative types of detector are possible. This one measures refractive index. The time that each component takes to come off the column is called its retention time and can be used to help identify it. Here, the HPLC instrument is being used to separate a mixture of two steroids used in a pharmaceutical preparation. The column chosen is packed with a non-polar solid. The tails of the molecules represent hydrocarbon chains C8H17. Having chosen the solvents, detector wavelength and flow rate, a single sample is run by injecting about 20 microliters into the injection port. The more polar component comes off the column first, followed by the less polar. The peak at retention time, 1.5 minutes, represents other ingredients used in formulating the product. This is the pharmaceutical product, and behind it, it's chromatogram. Okay, so students, that's it for today. I uh, think this will be too much. If we continue, we can continue, but uh, I want to make it till here. So, we see us tomorrow, same time, and continue with the same topic. So, thank you very much. Yeah, have a nice day. Yeah, take care then. Bye-bye.